This is the short video lecture pertaining to sustaining biodiversity in regards to protecting species and ecosystems. On your screen is a list of key terms associated with the chapter. I've highlighted some in blue that are important for you to know. The HIPCO acronym was introduced in a previous lecture and it's important that you're aware of that acronym and what it stands for. Because extinction of a species typically takes a very long time, it's not easy to document. It's estimated that we have identified only about 2 million of the world's estimated 8 million to 100 million species. Biological extinction occurs when a species can no longer be found anywhere on Earth. Mass extinction has been documented from a geological history of fossils that have been found. Our history from a geological perspective indicates that there's been five mass extinctions. After each mass extinction, biodiversity returned and often was higher than before. Please note that the recovery of a mass extinction took millions of years. Also, during each mass extinction, between 50 to 90 percent of all species appeared to have become extinct. Scientists actually use background extinction rates to study populations. Current annual rate of species extinction is between 100 to 1,000 times that of the background extinction rate. The way that they determine background extinction rates is by comparing human development with fossil records of extinctions that occurred before human development. They observe how decreases in habitat affect extinction and they use mathematical population viability analysis models to estimate the risk of a particular species becoming endangered or extinct within a certain time frame. Currently, we are losing 2 to 27 species per day, or 1,000 to 10,000 species per year. One of the main contributing causes of species extinction or species becoming threatened or endangered in terms of population numbers is loss of habitat. If 90% loss of land habitat occurs, about 50% of the species living in that area will become extinct. So protecting habitat must be a component of how we protect species populations. On the screen in front of you are four critically endangered species. These are threatened with extinction largely because of human activities. The number below each photo indicates the estimated number of individuals of that species remaining in the wild. On the left we have the Mexican gray wolf. There are about 42 of these species remaining in the forests of Arizona and New Mexico. Here is the California condor. There used to only be nine California condors in 1986 remaining. Now we have an estimated 226 condors in southwestern United States. So this species is recovering but not near the numbers it used to be and it's still considered critically endangered. The whooping crane has numbers as low as 437 birds in North America. That's a large geographical area for that small number of birds. The Sumatran tiger, there, it's estimated that there's no more than 500 of these left in Indonesia Island off Sumatra. A century ago, there were probably more than 230,000 orangutans in total, but the Bornean orangutan is now estimated at about 104,000 based on updated geographic range. And the Sumatran orangutan is about 7,500 um, individuals, and the Sumatran orangutan specifically is considered critically endangered. Orangutans are the largest tree living mammal in the world. They have remarkable abilities for traveling through the forest canopy. They actually make their homes in the trees. They find their food there. They build their tree nests each night out of leaves and branches. This is where they live and sleep, sometimes as much as 120 feet above the ground. Orangutans usually have little need to come down from the trees as they are uniquely and very well adapted for their arboreal lifestyle. The orangutan also has the longest childhood dependence on the mother of any animal in the world. Because there's so much for the young orangutan to learn in order to survive, the babies will actually nurse until they're about six years old. 
the other thing associated with the orangutans is that they bear young every eight years. This is the longest time between births of any mammal on earth, hence they have a very low reproductive rate. A female orangutan may only have four to five babies in her lifetime. So this is really why the orangutan populations are slow to recover from land disturbances that disrupt their habitats. The orangutans are definitely one of the most critically endangered of the great apes due to poaching and habitat loss from deforestation and palm oil plantations that are devastating Indonesia. So this is a map depicting where the orangutans live and it's off the coast of Asia between Asia and Australia in the Indonesia area. So why should we work to prevent extinction possibilities? Well, we depend a lot on different plant species for food, for fuel, lumber, paper, and medicine. And many species contribute to economic services as well. A sharp reduction in biodiversity causes a reduction in speciation and can impact the stability of an ecosystem and the food web upon which that ecosystem is based. And many people believe that each wild species has an inherent right to exist regardless of whether it's useful to us or not. So how do we, as humans, accelerate species extinction rates and impact their ecosystem services? The acronym HIPCO is highlighted on the slide in front of you, H-I-P-P-C-O. You were introduced to this acronym previously, but I will review it again. Habitat destruction, degradation, and fragmentation is the single greatest threat to species. The greatest elimination of species because of habitat loss are deforestation in our tropical areas, destruction of coral reefs and wetlands, and planting of monoculture crops on diverse grasslands. So out of all the items listed on this screen, habitat loss, meaning destruction, degradation, and fragmentation has the greatest impact on species population. We have certain species that are considered endemic species where they're found nowhere else on earth and habitat loss is the greatest risk to these types of species and I'll talk about those in more detail in a few more slides. Another cause of species extinction or ways that we accelerate it is introducing non-native species into areas where uh, they outcompete the native species. So invasive non-native species. Here in the United States, we've had over 7,100 non-native species introduced, and I'll talk in more detail about those as well in a few slides from here. Population growth and increasing use of resources continues to threaten uh, habitat as well as impact the environment and make it degraded and not usable by certain species. Pollution also impacts species population numbers. In fact, we've already learned about the honeybee colony collapse disorder and it's been documented that pesticides kill about 20% of the honeybee colonies that pollinate one-third of our United States crops. Also, pesticides have been linked to declining bird population as well as impacting fish populations each year. Climate change is another category that is affiliated with humans and our reliance on fossil fuels and the fact that we're accelerating climate change which is also accelerating the potential for species extinction and we'll talk more about climate change in um, future presentations. Over exploitation is the overuse of a resource and we're going to look at this from a standpoint of uh, hunting and poaching in regards to species population that can be at risk for extinction. So invasive species, uh, we've talked about in previous lectures, but I want to focus on one specifically, and that's the zebra mussel. In the Great Lakes region in the United States, there are more than 185 non-native species that have been introduced. I'd like to focus on the zebra mussel. Its rapid growth is evident in the statistic that females can lay over 1 million eggs during the spawning season. Also, these mussels can even survive outside of water in moist and cool condition for a few days. It is known that bioinvaders affect aquatic systems and are blamed for about two-thirds of the fish extinctions in the United States up through 2009. 
As mentioned, the Great Lakes have been invaded by 185 non-native species, and at least 13 of the recent invading species have threatened some kind of native species and caused billions of dollars in damage. The fish-killing lamprey is an example of this. As far as the zebra mussel is concerned, it not only threatens biodiversity, but also commerce. It's displaced some native species and depleted the food supply for others. It's actually clogged pipes, as depicted here in the middle picture. It's shut down water intake pipes for power plants and city water supplies. It has jammed up ship rudders and grown in huge masses on boat hulls, boat hulls, piers, and other solid surfaces. The first time the zebra mussel showed up in North America was in 1988, in the Great Lake region. The first account of an established population came from the Canadian waters of Lake St. Clair, a water body that connects to Lake Huron and Lake Erie. By 1990, zebra mussels had been found in all of the Great Lakes, just two laters after the original sighting. The following year, these zebra mussels escaped the Great Lakes Basin and found their way into the Illinois and the Hudson River. The Illinois River was the key to their introduction into the Mississippi River watershed, which now covers, which covers about 1.2 million square miles. By 1992, the following rivers had established populations of zebra mussels, the Arkansas, the Cumberland, the Hudson River, the Illinois River, the Mississippi River, the Ohio, and the Tennessee River. By 1994, just six years after they were first discovered in the Great Lakes region, the following states had reported records of zebra mussels within their borders, including Alabama and Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, New York, Ohio, Utah, Vermont, West Virginia. The list just goes on. We're going to look at a map depicting the distribution of the zebra mussels over time. So in 1988, this is where zebra mussels were documented to occur, and it's strictly around the Great Lakes region. In 1998, 10 years later, notice how the zebra mussels have spread throughout the Mississippi River watershed. And then currently, this is where the zebra mussel occurrences have occurred throughout the Mississippi River watershed and increased numbers of locations within the Great Lakes region. The concern is that these uh, zebra mussels are going to spread into other regions in western United States. And the map also depicts mus mussels that were trailered over land on boat, boat holes by the stars. So usually at locations in the western United States before you can put the boat in the water, it must be checked to assure that there aren't any zebra mussels on the hull of the boat or whatever water vessel you're bringing to try to stop the spread of it throughout the western United States. So prevention is the best way to reduce threats from invasive species. Um, once non-native species become established, it's almost impossible to remove them. Just, you know, backtracking to the map of the zebra mussels spreading across the Mississippi River watershed. Um, the best way is just to prevent their introduction in the first place and limit the threats of those non-native species. Also, providing funding to research the bioinvader characteristics and figure out ways to control the numbers of the bioinvader. And using satellite observations and ground surveys to help predict dispersal patterns and ways in which um, that dispersal pattern can be cut short. In addition, on an international level, it's important to identify harmful invader species and establish treaties that ban their transfer from one country to another. Um, this is done for endangered species. Uh, however, stepping it up to do inspection of imported goods to enforce such bans of non-native species would be beneficial. Also make sure that any cargo ships discharge their ballast water and replace it with salt water at sea before entering any ports or require them to sterilize such water or to pump nitrogen into the water to displace dissolved oxygen and kill any kind of aquatic, aquatic invader organisms. And then finally, educating the public about the environmental harmful effects of releasing exotic plants and pets into the environment near where they live. And a good example of this is the python that has been released into the Florida Everglades and the impact it's having um, in the Everglades on other native species.